God's Word for Us.com. If you have tuned in this morning or this afternoon and listening to the Word of God, is great opportunity that the Lord has given to us to share the message of the truth that brings redemption and freedom to souls. Let's pray. He is able, abundantly able, to deliver and to save. He is able, abundantly able, to deliver those who trust in Him. He is able, yes, Lord, abundantly able to deliver, yes, Lord, and to save. You are able, my Lord, you are abundantly able to deliver those who trust in you. I came to worship you. I came to worship you. Your holy name we praise. You are my Lord. I How I love you, Lord. Your holy name we praise. You are my Lord. I came to worship you. I came to love you, Lord. Your holy name we pray, Jesus Lord, you are my Lord. I worship you, Lord. I give you worship, Lord. Near the last worshiping. Let's sing in glory. I sing the little boss in the Rama Nerea Darababa. He can let the little boss in the Rama Koruan Darama. She did the boss in the Yamama. He let the little boss in the Yamama Nerea Bros to the robots in the Yamama. Lord, I give you worship. Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you. I give you glory, I give you worship. I give you worship, my God. I give you worship, my God. You are my Lord. How I love you. Yes, I love you, Lord. I came to seek your face. You are my Lord. Father, I love you. Father, I worship you. Father, I give you the reverence that you alone deserve. I magnify your name because you are good God. In your hand there is safety. In your presence there is fullness of joy and security. At your right hand side are pleasure for those who love it. Here we are, O oh God, I and the people that you have given unto me. We are for the signs and wonders. We have come to seek your will. We have come to seek your ways because our ways have disappointed us, O God. Our ways have failed us. Our ways have shipwrecked our life. And therefore, this afternoon, Lord, we have come to seek your face. You said that if we would diligently seek after you, you will show yourself strong. Therefore, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you be revealed to anyone who is listening to me this afternoon. I pray that your house will touch people. Save through me, O oh God. Save life through me. Bring conviction to people who are going to listen to this message, O oh God. That your life will be changed eternally for your glory. As you are coming very soon to pick up those who are yours. As you are coming for your bride, Lord, I pray that give me another opportunity to prepare your bride for you. Holy Spirit, speak through me. 
Holy Spirit, touch through me. Holy Spirit, affect life through me. In the name of Jesus Christ, let your glory be seen. And let your name be exalted above every other name. Thank you because you love your children. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Mandele bossi, kabala la la ba, zinelele le bossi, kabrosi, telelele bossi, ata. Randelele le bossi, na 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 delele le bossi, kelele. You are all my glorious Lord. You are all my holy. You deserve the glory. Mandele le bossi, kara mandele le bossi, ta ya na 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 na. We give glory to our Lord, our God. We worship His holy name because He is good God. Mm, hallelujah. Thanks be to the name of the Lord. Please kindly open your Bible with me into the book of Luke chapter number 2. We're going to read the verse number 52. And we're going to talk about walking in the fullness of God. Walking in the fullness of God. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing that God requires of us. There is nothing that God demands from us. There is no other purpose in which God created us than to become like him. Than to become like him and to walk in the fullness of who he is. In the book of Luke, Gospel chapter number 2, the verses number 52 the Bible says that and Jesus Christ increased in wisdom and stature and in the favor with God and man. Jesus Christ increased. He increased in stature and in favor with God and man. He increased. We want to talk about walking in the fullness of God. What does it mean to walk in the fullness of God? Basically, to walk in the fullness of God means to grow into the nature of God. If you don't know who God is, you can't walk into his fullness. And therefore, the Bible says that Jesus Christ, he was 100% God and he was 100% man. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians chapter number 2 verse 9 that he is the fullness of God heard. Jesus is the fullness of God heard. What does it mean? When we're talking about the God heard, we're talking about the constitute of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That means if Jesus Christ was the fullness of them, that means in Jesus was the Father, in Jesus was the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is the Son of God. So in Jesus, we have the three, the triune God working together in one body. This is why he came to manifest. Jesus came to reveal the Father, and he came to introduce the Holy Spirit to us. The Bible says that Jesus Christ increased. To increase means he raised from one level to another level. He moved from one standard to another standard. To increase means to grow big, to grow wide, to expand. So here Jesus Christ did not remain as a child. He didn't remain as human being, but he remained both man and God. Jesus increased in wisdom. He increased in wisdom. That means since he became man, he has to increase. As God, he need not to increase because he remained the same. But as man, he has to increase. The reason why Jesus increased from wisdom was that he has reduced his godly nature to take his human nature. It is not an easy thing at all. It is not an easy thing at all. It's one of the most difficult things that a person would do to reduce from one higher level to lowest level. You can, you can imagine as a king. A king becoming a slave is not an easy thing. <laughs> a king becoming a slave, that means he has to reduce from his kinship, authority, and nature 
to become as a fallen human being. And that wasn't a joke at all. It was a bad thing. It was a burden. And not only that, he has to embrace also his godly nature to function in the human nature. He had to embrace his godly nature to be able to function in the dimension of being God. So he has to walk 100% God and 100% man. So the Bible says that Jesus Christ increased in both man and remain as God. He remained as God. He remained as God, but he has to develop. He has to develop how to behave as a man. He didn't know how to behave like man. He has never seen before. So he didn't know how to walk like man. If you, you may not understand me, but let's have this picture. You are living in the standard of life. You've never known living in let's say a very remote country in the developing country like africa or asia where lighting system water system is not flowing so you move away from countries like united nations germany or uh, america and you come to live in africa and you need to adapt that is a word you need to adapt yourself to the system hmm in in United country or, or, or in the developed countries, if you want to go to Lou water system, everything is flowing. But in such countries in Africa, and uh, this system is not there. So you need to adapt to it. In the developed country, you have your car, you just step into your car, and straight away you drive to the town town center or city center. You go to shopping mall, everything is available. You pick them. In Africa, it's not like that. So you have reduced from one standard, a very high standard, to a lower standard that whenever you want to buy anything, you need to be on queue. Sometimes you need to order, you need to stand in queue to join a car or a train or a bus. This is how it was. Now Jesus has to reduce himself from being God to become man. But let me be very careful the word I use here. He reduced the means not, not that he, he moved away from being God, but he needed to adjust his godly nature to suit his human nature. And he did it by this way, by increasing in wisdom, and therefore he has to. Wisdom is accumulation of, of knowledge, or, uh, sorry, application of knowledge. So before you can have wisdom, you need to constantly and progressively learn certain things. So Jesus has to go through studies. He has to go through studies. How he went through the studies, I believe it was the Holy Spirit that took him through that studies. So Jesus Christ has to walk in that dimension. The Bible says that he, number one, increased in wisdom and in stature. The stature the state of God, godly, God, 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 godly person that God had that he is, he has to grow in that. He needs to develop. In which way? He must know how to appropriate himself. He must know how to live. That is the, the task. He must know how to live with his godly nature in human form. He must know that. So the Bible says that he grew within wisdom and in stature and he sought for the favor of God and the favor of man. And that is another hard work. He needs to please the Father. He needs to please the Father. In which way? By loving the Father with all his heart, with all his might, and being ready to do the Father's will. He needs to please the Father. And by pleasing the Father, he has to love the Father above his own will. He has to love the Father above his own feelings and his emotions. He has to love his Father above everything. Not only that, he must appropriate the same love for his humanity. That is a difficult thing. 
He did not only love the Father, but he must love humanity also. And therefore, he couldn't destroy what he was coming to save. He couldn't uh, do anything but against what he was coming to save. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a big tax for Jesus Christ. That was a big tax. Winning the favor of men and winning the favor of God. Man has fallen from the state of God into a state of sin. Man became sin. Man did not only sin, but after, after man sin, man became sin. So right from the morning to the night, the desire, the inclination in the heart of man was turning away of the nature of God. Who is God? The Bible says that God is spirit. According to the book of John chapter number 4, Jesus Christ made us aware when he met the woman in the well of Jacob. He said, God is a spirit. God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That means for Jesus to win the favor of God, he must stay constantly in spirit. Mm. Well, so what do we mean to work in the fullness of God? Means constantly living in the spirit. Mm -hmm. For you to be able to walk in the fullness of God, you must handle percent and constantly, every day of your life, you must be in the spirit. Mm. What does it mean to be in the spirit? To be in the spirit means to abide in the ways of God, in the will of God, to have the Holy Spirit present dwelling in your heart, to have your mind changed into the word of God, and to have your heart changed into the heart of Christ. Walking in the spirit is the combination of so many things. Number one, your heart must be changed. Your heart must be changed. Your mind must be changed. That will affect your feelings, your emotion, your desire. And that must affect also your values. So it's a combination of so many things coming together. Number one, you must be born again. To become born again means you need to have the Holy Spirit reviving your dead spirit, which because of sin and trespasses and transgression have put your, your spirit, because man is a spirit also. God is a spirit. And in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, he said, let us make man in our image. So therefore God created spirits. So God is a spirit, and he created the image of man to be also a spirit. So man also is a spirit. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, we can't change it. That is who we are. And that is how God has made us. So God is a spirit. And man is a spirit. However, man reduced from the level of God nature of spirit. Man reduced that by sinning. By sinning. Adam did it. Adam sinned against God. And because of that, sin has remained in the mark of human soul to pursue. I don't believe that we were born as sinners. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe that Adam, Adam was not born as a sinner. Adam fell into sin. He chose to sin. Adam wasn't born as a sinner. So God will not create human being as a sinner. But man were born into a sinful world. And therefore, since we were born into sinful world, all our choices around us are sinful. That is how it is. Man begin to grow up in an environment, and as a child, you begin to play with sin on our world. <laughs> oh, yes. We, we play with sin. The books that we read are written by sinful people. Mm. The toys that we play with, uh, we play with sinful toys because we don't know the mandate and the purpose of those toys. So we, we, weren't, we weren't born as sinners, but we were born into sinful environment that everything that we do is sin. Everything around us is sin. Why? Because it was made by sinful men. 
God being a holy God, whatsoever he does is holy. God being a spirit, everything that he makes is spirit. Man has reduced from being holy man. Let's say holy man. <laughs> man has reduced from being holy to become sinful. And therefore, all that man manufacture is sin. So we don't struggle to sin. We don't struggle to sin. Our alphabets are sinful. Uh, our numerals are sinful. Everything that we do is sin. And therefore, we are so sweet 24-7. Our, our activities are involved with sin more than righteousness. So when does a person turn away from um, living a sinful life or being influenced by sin? A person can only be turned away from being influenced by sin by turning to Jesus Christ. By turning to Jesus. In the book of John chapter number 3, there was a man that, that came to Jesus in the night. His name is Nicodemus. He was asking Jesus, how can I walk in the fullness of God? How can I walk in the fullness of God? Let's go there. Ladies and gentlemen, to walk in the fullness of God means to operate like God. Mm. To walk in the fullness of God is to have the fullness of God dwelling in you. And therefore, if I change every aspect of your life and you operate like God. You talk like God, you behave like God, you think like God, you feel like God. And that is not an easy task, but it is achievable. You and me can live that life. We can live that life because Christ Jesus has made everything possible. Jesus has made everything available for you and me to be able to live like him and to talk like him and behave like him. So it's not something very difficult at all. Nicodemus came to Jesus Christ in the book of John, the chapter number 3, walking in the fullness of God. John chapter number 3, let's read something about that. I will come back. I'm not deviating at all. John chapter number 3, the Bible says that there was a man who was a Pharisee. His name is Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. He came to him in the night. He came to him in the night because of his position, because of the influence and the values that he has been living with has been challenged. Nicodemus came to Jesus because his value has been challenged. He was challenged. So listen to what he did. He came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, mean teacher, Rabuni, teacher. Rabuni, we know, mm, that is all I love much. He said, we know, we know, we know who are we? We are the Pharisees. <laughs> we argue, but we know it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, every child of God know. Every human being on earth know what is evil and what is right. We know. If the Pharisees knew who Jesus was, that he was a righteous person, yet they argue. I am telling you, if you are still in sin, living in the church and operating like whatever you want, you are arguing and, and dialoguing every now and then and arguing and all kinds of holiness and, and, and you're having doubts and all things concerning God. You know who God is. Why? Because God has left himself without any reputation in our soul. Every child of God, every human being created on earth knows God. He knows who he is. He knows he who is. So we know. Means we are aware. We understand. That you are from God. But we don't believe. We know. We are aware. We understand. But we don't believe. That is the problem. We can know. We can understand. But we might not believe. That is the point. I've had the time that I've been talking to people, trying to minister to them the word of God, and they would tell me, Gabriel, you know what? All that you are telling me, I know. But I can't do it. Not that they can't do it. Because they can't do it, come in when you are ready. When you are willing and you surrender. Every human being on earth is capable of believing in God if the person wants. 
is our will to surrender our wills and our will to God. That is all that the matters. So Nicodemus came to Jesus Christ and said, We know that thou art a teacher came from God, for no man can do this miracle that you are doing except God is with him. No man can operate. No man can walk in the fullness because we have seen. We have seen the evidence of the presence of God in your ways. We have seen the evidence of the presence of God. There is a mark of God which is working in your life. We don't doubt that, Jesus. We don't, uh, you know what? The Pharisees never doubted. They never doubt. There wasn't a doubt in them concerning who Jesus Christ, the deity of God in Christ, they never doubted. They never. There was no dispute because every evidence about the works of Christ, every evidence and the proof that they needed to be convinced, they have it. And that is why Nicodemus came to him and said, I am convinced that nobody can operate, nobody can walk in the fullness of God except God is with him. Mm. Nicodemus was challenged. I know there are so many pastors who are doing miracles these days. <laughs> the miracle is not the evidence. Uh, when you lay your hands upon somebody and that person get healed, don't think that it is you. It is the grace of God. So God can still use sinners to, to, to heal people. So, so don't, don't think that for the fact that when you lay your hands upon people, things happen because Jesus sent the, the disciples in the book of Luke, I think that's chapter number 10, and they came back to Jesus and they brought a report, the 72. And they said, Lord, when we went, the demons, they all obeyed us. Jesus said, I saw Satan falling. I saw him falling 2,000 years ago before I came down. Falling like a light, like a flash. They fell. But don't be glad. Don't be glad that demons listen to you. <laughs> Uh, don't be glad. Don't be glad that when you lay your hands upon sinners, when you lead people sinners, and say, believe that Jesus died on the cross. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you. Let me tell you. It is not your hands that you have laid. It is your belief that Jesus is God that will bring the change. The only way to bring a person to deliverance is stop struggling yourself. Stop struggling. As the person, let him invite the fullness of God to dwell in his body. Lead a person to invite the fullness of God to dwell in the person's body. Sickness will go because in the fullness of God there is no sickness. Poverty will leave because in Jesus there was no poverty. Mm. Mm. When we know these principles and teach people to walk according to the ways of God, struggle will be very, very few. We are struggling so much. That is what I believe this morning the Lord touched my heart. When I wake up, he says, son, talk about walking in the fullness of God to my people. The time has come that my children need to walk in the fullness of God. That wherever we are, we represent God. When we come and pass by, people will know, mm, God was here. God was here. In our working place, in our homes, when we leave a place, somebody will say, mm, I do always hear. I was once working with, with a lady, and, it was, and that lady was very clean. And I, I love her. I really loved her. So when me and her were on duty, oh, oh, we cleaned the whole place. The whole place will be picobello. Everything will be clean. So when people come to work, they don't find where they put their pen yesterday when they drop a sheet of paper. So when people resume work, you see them looking into the dustbin, looking here and there, and they begin to ask, was this lady here last yesterday, or who was on duty? I said, this person was there. I said, wow, no wonder. Can you, your presence, drive away filth? That is what I'm talking about. Your presence as a child of God must be able to remove dirty things out of the way that people will see a mark of you. Walking in the fullness of God. Walking in the fullness of God. Me operating like God. That demons will listen to you. Demons will listen to you. Which is, I can tell you so many testimonies, but it is not necessary. A young man approached me in those days when I was living 
in the Germany, I think you have heard this story before, a brother who has been stricken with alcoholism, he was also running a homosexual life, and uh, my wife met him in town and brought him home. That man was totally gone. And not only that, he was being tormented with the spirit of suicide, which is one of the highest rate in Europe. Suicidal thoughts. Suicidal thoughts. Oh my God. Suicidal thoughts is everywhere in Europe here. Especially UK, <laughs> where I live now. So the question that the brother came, and one time we ministered to him and the Lord actually delivered him from drinking alcohol, delivered him from homosexual life, and he started living a Christian life. For some time, we were not seeing him any longer. He went back and backslided again. He went back. He couldn't stay with us. He backslided because um, he speaks German and, and, and Russian language. And he wouldn't feel all that good because I need to translate. Whenever I'm, I'm teaching, I need to translate from English to German. And he decided to fellowship with the people of his kind. I said, I have no, nothing wrong with that. You can go with them and, and study the word of God with a provided that your spirit is going to grow. To cut a long story short, he couldn't. So he came back with the same spirit. And um, so one time he was terrified. He came home and he said, you know, Gabriel, I am, I'm, 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 I'm being tormented to kill myself. I said, what is wrong with you? Let's go into your house. When we went into his house, the Holy Spirit made us aware that he is the fifth person. He is the fifth person living in that room who is about to die. Four people have lived in that room. Two couples, they have killed themselves in that room. The spirit of suicide was hanging around in that room. So I went with him and we started praying. We started praying. In the name of Jesus. In the name of when we went in, I asked him, Did you hear the voice? Because he 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 used to hear the voice of those demons calling, inviting him, come here, come here, fall down on the window, come now, kill yourself. Yes, you can do it. You think you can do it? Oh, you are not strong, you are not strong, oh, you are weak. Prove yourself. So the demons were communicating with him. So when we entered into his room, I asked him, Do you hear them? They said, Yes, I hear them. I said, All right. Let's pray. So we started praying. We started praying. We are, I was praying and praying and praying. All of a sudden, he said he's not hearing the voice again. All that he heard that they were running away, they were going. He said, Gabriel, they are afraid of you. They are running away. I said, they are not afraid of me. They are afraid of my Jesus. Oh, they are afraid. The demons are afraid of my Jesus, not me. But when I appeared, Jesus appeared. What does it mean? A child of God, you are a possessor of Jesus Christ. And wherever you are, demons must run away. So when you lay your hands upon people and they get their healing, don't be happy. Don't be happy. Because it is Christ who is working in you. But there is one thing which is very important. Know that you are a Christian. <laughs> know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what Jesus said. Don't be glad that the demons listen to you, but be glad that your name are written in the Lamb's book of life. To walk in the fullness of God, number one, your name must be written in the Lamb's book of life. You must be born again. You must, at a point in time, invite Jesus into your heart. And inviting him is, doesn't end there. You need to go through water baptism to fulfill all scripture because Jesus did that. To fulfill that. Why? Jesus said, Jesus said this, Jesus answered and said unto Nicodemus, Very, very, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Ah, hold a minute. Jesus does not answer us according to what our mind is thinking, but according to what our heart needs. Nicodemus is talking about nobody can do miracles. So basically, I believe that Nicodemus was attracted by the miracle power of Jesus Christ. And Jesus diverted the dialogue. It is not a question of miracle, but it's a question of walking in the fullness of God, having the approval of God, the seal of God in your life. 
that produces miracles. Miracles are the fruits. They are fruits. <laughs> Jesus said that the food for the children. So for you and me to be able to operate in the dimension where Christ is manifested in our life, we need to be born again. Jesus said that. Except a man be born again. And this is the concept, the born again concept is one of the most uh, mispresented doctrine. Who is a born again believer? Nicodemus asked them, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can I enter into my mother's womb on the second time and be born again? It sounds funny. But that is how some of us, we think that what born again is. We are born again because my mother is a Christian. <laughs> so I'm a born again believer. You want to enter into your mother's womb. No, you can't. I'm a born again believer because my father is a priest. My father is a preacher. I, I was born into a Christian home. All my family members are Christians. But to be honest with you, <laughs> if God opened your eye to see that how many people are Christian in your family, you'd be shocked. They might be churchgoers. They might be deacons and deaconesses, elders and pastors in the church. But they are not Christians. They are not born again believers. So you cannot become born again by your mother believe or your father's faith. In Christianity, being born into it doesn't count. I was born into Christian home. Doesn't make me a Christian. My father was a clergy. My father was a catechist, Presbyterian preacher. Maybe you have heard my testimony and my, 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 lesson, my, my, my story before, but he was married into two women. Mm. I thought that he was a Christian until I came to understand the word of God that polygamy is sin. Polygamy is sin. So my father operating in polygamy, the African culture where I was born into it, I said that. The church that he was going, partially, partially speak against that. So he was floating without any problem. Hmm. But in the sight of God, he was practicing sin. He was walking in sin. So he wasn't a Christian to me. Nah. But I thought I was born into Christianity. You might be walking in deception like that. You think that you have been born into a church. You go to church, therefore you're a Christian. I'm afraid. You belong to a denomination, doesn't make you a Christian. Your name written in the denominational book doesn't make you a Christian. Walking in the fullness of God means having your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Number one, it comes by believing that Jesus is the Lord, the Son of God. He died for your sin. He loves you so much. It's all about God loves. Embracing the love of God. Admitting that God loves you so much. And when you come and confess your sin, tell him everything that you have done against him. And sin you have done against people. And sin people have done against you. You need to ask for forgiveness of all. You need to dislocate yourself from any grip of sin. Any other what you have done, what people have done, and what somebody have done against you, you need to ask forgiveness. And if necessary, do the reconciliation. And not only reconciliation, do the restitution. You give everything that that sin demands. Sometimes sin demands justice. There are certain things that we have done that demand justice, that we need to pay back. Some error that we have done, mistake that we have done, we need to pay them back. When it happens like that, you must restore those things back. That is what we call restitution. Sometimes it may cost us. Sometimes it may cost us. There is a price. There is a price for every offense. There is a price that we need to. Sometimes we need to go to prison. Sometimes we need to go to cells. Sometimes we need to pay money, a certain amount of money back to people that we owe them. And if it is necessary and it requires of that, before you can be born again, you need to do that. Born again doesn't mean that you have accepted Jesus and into your personal Savior and that's it. No. There are so many things involved. There are, you must be free. You must be free from all things that are holding you or holding you captive. You must. And when you stand before God, there is no memory of any past mistake. There is no memory of anything that holds you, that worries you, that takes your peace away. 
To become born again means to enter into the rest of God. Where your soul is at rest, where your mind is at rest, you have the perfect peace of God at any time or at any place. So Jesus Christ, now answer Nicodemus, Jesus said, very, very, I say unto you, the Israelites or the Jewish tradition, the way to express themselves, to make things to become more meaningful was to, was to repeat, to repeat, to repeat the same word. Instead of saying, I swear, you don't swear. Stop swearing. So what they normally do is they repeat the same words. So Jesus said, verily, verily, I say truly, truly, he stressed upon that. Very, very, I say unto you, except a man be born of water, water baptism. To be born of water means after you have believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you must go through water baptism. It is very, very, very essential. For you to walk in the fullness of God, you must fulfill all scriptures. I'm not dealing with the water baptism today, so I'm going to go deep there. But basically, the water baptism is meaning that you are dying and resurrecting with Jesus Christ. Your sin is being literally washing away. And that physical wash away, you might not take it as meaningful as it is. But it has impact to your spirit. Your mind needs to be washed away. Your past must be washed away. So, when we enter into water baptism, our conscience will be washed, will be cleansed. So, water baptism is part of becoming born again. First of all, believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. At Jesus Christ to come and live in your heart, He will come. He will come. But you need to go through water baptism to understand the meaning and the importance of it. There are so many meanings to that. So many importance to that. You need to understand all of that. Dying with Christ, rising up with Him, allowing the water to wash your sins away physically. Physically, it needs. Some people go to the water when they come back, you see that their physical body is changed. Yes. People go through water baptism and when they come out, oh, then you might ask me, Brother Gabriel, what is it? Is it sprinkling or, or immersion? Well, Jesus did immersion. He never did sprinkling. So if you want to follow Jesus Christ, then do what is required. Do the proper one. There are so many arguments that where there is no water. Okay. What if there is water? You are not living in the desert where there is no water. So that your argument doesn't stand. Sometimes before you argue, think about other side. Where there is no water. If there is no water, where did they get that water from? So immersion is what the Bible requests. I don't know why the Catholic, Presbyterian, and Methodist, and the Church of England, where they practice all these things. I don't know. I don't know where they took it from. <laughs> it is not scripture. If we want to work in the fullness of God, let's fulfill scripture. It's vital. So Jesus said, except a man is born of water and of the spirit. To work in the fullness of God, you must be born of water and of the spirit. So first of all, you have accepted Jesus. He has come. You have confessed your sin. You have forgiven yourself. You have accepted the forgiveness of God. Then the next stage is go through water baptism by believing that, yes, you are ready to be saved. Sometimes, sometimes, these two things happen uh, simultaneously or sometimes it happens one before the other. Sometimes you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because to be born again means to have the Spirit of God waking your dead spirit up. When we become born again, our human spirit, which God breathed upon us and made us a living soul, God died when Adam sinned against God. When we are born into this life, that spirit is still alive. From the childhood, that spirit is still alive. After the age of five, where you begin to know the differences of what is evil and what is good. 
In the beginning, you try everything. You are not sinning. You don't know yet. So a child will take something and hit a glass. Then he doesn't know. God doesn't hold him responsible. But the day that a child will begin to understand that is not good. Don't do that. That is not good. That is bad. So a child begins to develop his understanding to know that this is bad. I shouldn't do it. The knowledge of good and bad make man responsible for his conduct and his action. That was what brought man. Man became aware of what is good and evil. The fall of man is that. Man begins to fall. Man begins to enter into sin when he knows what is good and evil. <laughs> Does it make sense? That is what the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 3. And God said now, man has become like one of us. He knows what is good and evil. It was a fall because he has missed the presence of God. God still remained like God. He knew good and evil, but he remained as God. So man can know good and evil in two forms, being in the sinful part and being in the godly parts. Does it make sense? That is what sin is. So you've got some people maybe in YouTube that are teaching that we were born in sin. I don't buy that idea. I disagree with them. And they have only one quotation or two quotations. Man go astray from birth. And, 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 and Psalm 51 where David said, I will conceive in sin. And in sin that my mother gave birth to me. David was arguing his case concerning God. But getting to the end, he said, In my innermost you require. In my innermost you demand holiness and righteousness. You, you demand purity in my innermost. So that means in the innermost being, man is not sin. Where, where holiness and righteousness is being required. That means man was not born a sinner. I won't go deep into that argument because I don't bother that there. When a man says that I was born as a sinner, he is telling me that nothing can change me. Mm. Look at my face. I'm so black. <laughs> my father is black. My mother is black. We may argue I'm not black. I'm brown. There is no way I can change it. I can't change it with makeup. I can't change it with eyelashes. I can't change it with eyebrow. There is no way I can change the skin color. No matter what I do, I remain like that. Will God judge me of being black? I was born as black. If God is going to judge me as black person, then I will have problem with God. God will not bore me. Uh, God will not hold me responsible. Thing that He created me to be. I was created to be black. I was born to be black person. Stop that argument. It helps you to sin against God. I was born in sin. It's not true. God doesn't want you to change anything that you were born to be. But he wants you to live according to what you were born to be. You are spirit. You were born as God. God said, let us make man like God. We are born, created in the form and an image of God. So God wants the likeness of God to be manifested. And that likeness of God can be only manifested, can only come to pass when you unite with your thoughts, God is the source of a spirit. He is the source of, of our godly nature. So when we come back to this God and begin to pursue who he is, then we begin to walk in his fullness. Nicodemus wanted to walk in the fullness of God. He said, can anybody do what you are doing? Walking on the sea, walking on the water, talking to water, and sickness. And he heard so many things that Jesus was doing and he was amazed. He said, no, 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 I want to see this Jesus. I want to know this man, this man by myself. And therefore he came and he saw this Jesus. Jesus wouldn't hide his face from him. He made him aware the thing that he needs, thing that he needs to be able to fulfill the mandate of walking in the fullness of God. So he said, you must have water baptism. And number two, you need to have the Holy Spirit baptism. What does it mean, the Holy Spirit baptism? Ladies and gentlemen, the difference between a sinner and a righteous person is this, the presence of the Holy Spirit. The only thing that qualifies you as a Christian, you might be born, you might have believed Jesus as your personal savior, you might have been going through water baptism, 
but you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, then you are not a Christian. There is no way you can walk in the fullness of God without the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Father, the nature. He's the whole being of who God is. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit. And man cannot have that spirit unless God gives it to him. He's the person of God heard. He's the person of God heard. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We don't arrange them by their position, but we arrange them by their nature. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not the Father who operates like a son. Neither is it the Holy Spirit that operates as God. No, they are three distinguished beings. Three distinct beings. The Father is there, the Spirit, Holy Spirit is there, and Jesus is there. Triune God. One, two, three. They all operate in the oneness. They have one purpose, they have one pursuit, and they do things the same. They don't contradict, they don't collide, they don't conflict with one another. They all function for one purpose and one reason. So a person to become born again means you need the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in this body. Apostle Paul said in the second Corinthians, I think the chapter number four, he said he has put his he has put his treasure on this earthly vessel. He has put the treasure. What is the treasure? The Holy Spirit needs to come upon this earthly mantle. This corruptible mantle. Corruptible means it stands for decay and death. This body can see death. So he said, the Lord has put in his spirit upon this mantle. That the excellence of our works may not be of us but it might be of him. And therefore, to be able to walk in the fullness of God, meaning that all this process to believe in Jesus, uh, to be born, uh, to be baptized in the water, leads you into this stage, having the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And that is the most important thing that you and me have to consider. Jesus said in the book of John, the chapter number 3, verse 24, he made this statement, and saying that God is a spirit. God is a spirit. He's holy and he is spirit. A spirit may inhabit in the body, but the pure spirit of God needs not only to inherit in our body, but it needs to regulate our life, our choices, and our lifestyle. Hmm? So when a person becomes born again, he invites Jesus into his life or her life. The Holy Spirit will come and dwell there. The Spirit of Christ will come and dwell. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. So Jesus will come and dwell in our body in the form of the Holy Spirit. He come and inhabits in our body. What does it mean? It simply means that God created this body for his spirit to dwell inside. This body is a container that needs to contain Holy Spirit. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. And he possesses us by dwelling in this body. And a person can become a possessor of God when he allowed the Spirit of God to come and dwell in us. Jesus said again after the resurrection, a spirit had no flesh and bones. As you see me, I uh, have. In Luke chapter number 24, verse 39, Jesus said, a spirit has no bone, and a spirit has no flesh. You and me, we are spirits. Man is a spirit, having a soul, dwelling in the third body man is a spirit he has a soul and the soul also is a spirit your soul is your spirit and both of them dwell in the, the third body basically the theologians has made us to understand that man actually your real being is the soul because in the soul is your intellect, your emotion, and your feelings. 
The intellect, your emotion, and in your feeling are in the soul. Where choices, where uh, the issues of life comes from. And they are intertwined with your physical heart. Hmm. Your spirit is basically intertwined with your physical heart. It's not this heart, this heart, and uh, upon the blood. It is in another spiritual realm inside your body, inside your mind, and inside your heart. There is a coordination in between along the line. It's very difficult. It's spiritual thing. It's so very difficult for me to tell you that when the doctor take you into uh, surgery uh, or into a theater, uh, he can open your heart and know where your your spirit. Uh, no, no, no. He can't find it. It's a spiritual realm. So it doesn't make sense for me to try to explain it to you but it is a part of you that control controls your mind your thoughts your intellect your feelings and your emotion um man was made to operate in that man was made to operate in that and that is the fullness of god to operate in the spirit to operate in the spirit so Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ coming on earth, he came to render forgiveness, forgiveness for man, for driven the Holy Spirit away from him. The purpose of Jesus coming was to ask for forgiveness for man. So when we ask for forgiveness, the Lord forgive me for allowing the Holy Spirit to go out of my body. Please let him come again. Instantly the Holy Spirit will come. That is what we call the born again experience. After we have asked for forgiveness, the Lord, I didn't know. So I couldn't contain you. I didn't allow the Holy Spirit. So man would then be born with the Spirit. Being born with the Spirit means the Holy Spirit will come. You will give the Holy Spirit the license now. He will never come without you inviting him in. He only comes when we have invited him in. So the Bible tells me that Jesus Christ opened the understanding of what born again experiences or what walking in the spirit or walking in the fullness of God means. Jesus said a man must be born in the spirit before he can operate as a kingdom of God candidate. What is the kingdom of God? Is the rulership of God operating in any environment? God is a king and his domain. God is a king and his wishes and his desire need to permeate, need to influence, need to control, need to take control in any environment. And where the kingdom of God is controlling, because Apostle Paul said the kingdom of God has not come by eating and drinking, but it is holiness and righteousness in the spirit of God. The kingdom is holiness and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Beloved, this, that which is born of the flesh is the flesh, Jesus said, and that which is born of the spirit is the spirit. Marvel not, I have said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blow where it wishes. Thou hear the sound thereof, but cannot feel where it come. And whether it goes, so it is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Jesus said that when you become born again, when you have the Holy Spirit, your life will now be influenced like a wind. You'll be directed. you become a miracle person. Things will happen in your life that people cannot trace you and know. Where is it coming from? Where is this thing coming from? You begin to operate in a miracle that people will not understand you. Your life will become like a wind. Who wants to understand wind? So to work in the fullness of God, you need the Holy Spirit influence over your life then you can operate in the fullness of God. You can operate in the fullness of God. What do I mean? To be able to operate in the fullness of God, 
you need to operate in the totality of living in the spiritual realm. Genesis chapter number 2, the verse number 7. Let's go there and learn something from there. I'm giving you the series, Walking in the Fullness of God. This is the first teaching that you are going to hear. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. The Bible, the basic instructions before leaving the earth, the holy book, the only book that God is going to use to, 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 to judge the world. It says in verse number 17, sorry, verse number 7, verse number 7, that God breathed into man, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. So to walk in the spirit means to become a living soul. Your soul must live. Mm. What does it mean your soul lives? Your soul lives means your soul will have a connection to God. The living soul means your, the spirit of God dwell in this body to make your soul alive. If your soul is not alive, you are dead. It's a question of time. And death means separated from the source. When anything is separated from the source, it's dead. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. When you go to markets, supermarkets, and buy flour, just give three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten days. It will wither and it will be destroyed. It will be destroyed. Some people are walking on this earth. They think that they are alive, but they are dead. Man became a living soul. For for you to be walking in the fullness of God, you must have your soul to be alive. And your soul can be only alive when it becomes born again. Walking in the fullness of God. Walking in the fullness of God. First Corinthians chapter 15, where Apostle Paul spoke to us about the rapture. When he gave us the rapture lessons. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But Paul said in the verse number 45, walking in the fullness of God means that your soul being regenerated, your soul being revived. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. And the last Adam was made a quickened spirit. A quickened spirit. Do you hear that? So we must be moved away from being Adamic nature to become God again. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ never had Adamic nature in him. He was 100% spirit. According to Brother Paul, Jesus never had Adamic nature in him. What does it mean? Jesus didn't have the components, the components that should cause him to sin. Is that what it means? He the Bible said that he was hundred percent God and hundred percent man. That means he was also, he was also. Having the capability to sin. Yeah, he didn't sin. So what made Jesus different from Adam then? What made Jesus different from Adam? I need to explain this part to you very carefully. Because this is what once I thought. That Jesus was 100% God. So what is amazing about Jesus Christ? That... He didn't sin and he walked in the spirit 24 7. And that what is amazing on that. There's one thing in common with Adam and Jesus Christ. 
It's one thing in common. They were all created by God. They were all made in the image of God. They all have the blood in them. The one thing that made Adam to live was Adam lived for the soul. He didn't live for the spirit. Adam responded to the soulish desire. He didn't respond to the, his spiritual desire. Man is a spirit. Man is a soul. And both of them live in the dirt body. Man is a soul. He had the spirit of God in him. That want to dominate the soul. And control the soul. To live for God. The only difference personally I as I understand the word of God. Adam had everything that Jesus had. Jesus had everything that Adam had. But the difference between them was. Adam responded to the soulish realm. His feeling, his emotion, his desire, his intellect. But Jesus responded to the spirit hunger. For remaining with God. Remaining like God. Walking like God. Soaking like God. Sleeping where ordinary people sleep. Yet he decided to live for the spirit. That is what my understanding of that word means. Jesus had everything that Adam had. Yet he didn't sin. Adam had everything that Jesus had. Yet he sinned. Does it make sense? You and me have both. We have Jesus dying on the cross to remove our damnic choices out of us and to make the choice that Jesus made. To walk in the fullness of the Spirit or the fullness of God means make the choice that Jesus made. What was the choice? He decided to live to fulfill the hunger of the spirit, not the hunger of the soul. Do you want to walk in that fullness where demons will run away, where situation will not control you, but you will control them? But you will be in stress and stress will not be in you. You'll be in a very stressful environment, yet you can sit down and sleep. I'm not saying that part of death around your house and don't clean them. <laughs> That is not what Christ wants us to be. And I'm talking about you being, you are in a very stressful environment, but you don't have a lot of stress to control your life. But you control stress in your life. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was made in the quickening spirit. In the quickening spirit. He was made who made him like that? God made him like that. And he responded to that. He lived for that. That's what Brother Paul is trying to say. He lived with the quickened spirit. Made here means not in the hands of God. It was in his hands. Jesus became a quickened spirit. God met him and he lived like that. So don't say that God made Jesus 100% God and 100% so Jesus, no, one time I thought like that. And in the dream, the Lord brought me into an arena. And I heard the Holy Spirit, Jesus talking to me. Sounds like very difficult to say who is talking, Jesus or the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I heard a voice saying that Jesus did well. Jesus did very well. I said, ah, what are you talking about? Jesus was God. Why did he do well? He need not to struggle the way I struggle. He said, son, he laid down his will. Matthew chapter 26. He laid down his will. Not my will, but let your will be done. He laid down his will. That is what he did. Ladies and gentlemen, to walk in the fullness of God, the key is lay down your will. Lay down your ways. Lay down your feelings. Lay down your emotions. And cling, cling to the quickened spirit in you. Anointing, oh, the man is anointed. Hmm. All right, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus became a quickened spirit. Verse 46 of 1 Corinthians 15. How about that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual? It means that 
Adam, live not as a spiritual person. Adam refused to live as a spiritual being. In which way? By clinging to his physical needs, not his spiritual needs. We live as a spiritual person by clinging to our spiritual needs. By clinging to our spiritual needs. When our knees, when our knees turn away from being spiritual to become physical, then, then we move away from being spiritual. Let's see how Adam lived. Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden according to the book of Genesis chapter number 3. The same chapter. And the woman, the, now the serpent was more subtle, carnal, crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He made unto, he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, Ye shall not eat of the every three in the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. Our temptations are not spiritual. Satan is not a spiritual being, therefore he can't tempt us spiritually. He tempts us social. In the soulish realm, Satan tempts us. The temptation of every man, the temptation of every man is to move away from the fullness of God and to walk outside the fullness of God. The Bible said that a serpent came unto Adam and his wife. Nobody know where Adam was, but his wife was ready, and the wife engaged herself. Why? Eve was caught hanging around a tree. He was caught hanging around a tree that could not save her. Where do you hang your life around? I personally believe had Eve laid or sat under the tree of life, the situation might have been different from what we are reading now. The situation might have been totally different. Eve was hanging around the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So when the serpent came, he met Eve under that tree. Where do you hang around? Determine what the temptation that you go through. If you hang around a spiritual people, your temptation will be, I want to be like them. If you hang around Jesus, Nicodemus was hanging around Jesus. He was following all the miracle working work of Jesus. Therefore, he came and said, no, 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 no. I am so attracted to this man. So he came to Jesus and said, we know. We know that you are a child of God. You are a teacher sent by God. Nobody can do what you are doing. Except God is with him. Adam and Eve fell because they hung around a tree. Their desire was the tree. So Satan came and said, Had God said that you shouldn't eat it? And Eve made a new law. Eve made a new law that God has not made. If you don't know what God has said, you can't practice it well. And so long as you don't know what God has said, you say what you want, and what you want will lead you outside the will of God. Listen to what Eve said. We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but we shouldn't touch it. We, sorry, and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die, lest you die. So Eve made her own law. And the law said that when we eat that fruit in the middle of the garden, and when we touch it, we will die. Why would Satan tempt? Why would Satan tempt Adam and Eve? I believe it was curiosity. They were curious. They were curious to know what was in that tree. Satan attracted them to it. 
You are tempted by the desires in you. You are tempted by the desires in you. Are you talking about, oh, there are so many temptations? Hey, Yama, wait a minute. Temptation will never come unless you desire it. I don't drink, therefore alcohol can never tempt me. I don't smoke, therefore smoking cigarette. Let them give it for free. It doesn't tempt me. I wouldn't even touch it. I wouldn't even touch it. I am married. I am married. And because I'm married, I do what marriage people do. Hmm. Therefore, I accept women. So if I don't take care, a woman can tempt me. Because whatsoever I can do with my wife, I can do with any woman that have the quality and things that attract me on my wife. That is where the temptation is. Thing that we accept, thing that we desire, thing that we think that it can satisfy some hunger in us. Because temptation is a hunger in us which is seeking satisfaction. Mm. If there is no hunger in you, there is no temptation. So I personally believed Adam and Eve was tempted to the tree because they were hungry for that. Jesus clung. He clung to the spirit and Adam and Eve clung to the soul and therefore they aborted the spirit. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat therefore, then your eyes will be open, and ye shall be God's, knowing good and evil. Listen to what Satan said. God knows. God is a liar. God is lying to you. God is preventing you from walking in the flesh. So God is aware that the day you eat your forbidden fruits, you will become like him. But unfortunately, the book, the Bible says God gave it a small God, not a big God. Because we can never, we can never become God, but we can become like him. We can become like him, but we can never be God. So here, according to the devil, the serpent instruction, you will be like God, you will know evil and give. That means you'll be in the standard and the level of God. What does it mean? Why will God turn man away from knowing good and evil? Because that wasn't good for man. That wasn't good. And even that evil was good for man, it was supposed to come through the hands of God. It was supposed to come through the hands of God. So God told Adam and Eve what they need. What they need to live in his presence. He said, the only thing that you need to live in my presence is to eat all the fruits in this garden. But this one, don't eat it. But the day you eat it, you'll be driven away from my presence. And that was a difficult task for man. Very, very difficult. Man couldn't accept that. Ladies and gentlemen, we can live like God. We can behave like God if we come back to the second Adam. And the last, basically he is the last Adam. He is a spirit quickened being. He lives with a spirit. And when the woman saw, the six of Genesis chapter number three, when the woman saw, is it the first time that she is discovering? Yes. Satan will drive your attention to discover things that you need to recover from. <laughs> so uh, Eve has to discover to recover. And the day that the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and that the tree to be desired to make one wise. A desire of wisdom. A desire of wisdom. Desire of knowledge. Desire of understanding. Which is not coming from God. Is the fall of man. That desire is not coming from God. But it is coming from the tree. That desire is not coming from the man. But it is coming from what he feeds on. 
Be very careful because what you feed on, the food that you eat might be contaminated. We have physical food and spiritual food according to Matthew chapter 4. Jesus answered uh, 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 the devil when he tempted him. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. When he tempted Jesus in the same manner. Let's go there then. Adam saw. Eve saw that the, 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 the tree was good for food. It was good. It was good. God said it is not good. It is not good for you to eat that food. But that day, Satan convinced Adam and Eve to know that it is good. Wow. Wow. And that it was pleasant. God said it is not pleasant. God said it is not pleasant. To the eyes. That day they saw that it was pleasant. And the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Woo! Should your wisdom come in from this fruit? What a deception. What a deception. And the first time the woman saw that the fruit can make one wise. Your wisdom is not in the fruit. Your wisdom comes from the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the source of the wisdom. The Bible said that and Jesus grew in wisdom. In which way did he grow in the wisdom? He didn't grow, you know we're coming back. He didn't grow in the wisdom by eating the fruit, the forbidden fruit. No. He grew in the wisdom by seeking the favor of God and the favor of man. First of all, he sought the favor of God. Favor. Favor. Favor is not fair. Favor is enjoying somebody's labor. Favor is enjoying somebody's sweat. While some people are, are struggling to get, you get it for free. That is favor. That's favor. When you get thin without paying price for them. Jesus has to develop our life by seeking favor. Not by works. Not by works. Seeking the favor of God. And how do we see the favor of God? We see the favor of God and man when our life is united with God. The favor of man will always be available for us. He saw the favor of God first and now he had the favor of man. Beloved, are you being blessed this afternoon? I believe you are. I believe you are. This is how to walk in the fullness of God. This is how to walk in the fullness of God. Seeking your daily breath from the mouth of God through the Holy Spirit, not from the mouth of the enemy. The same temptation was given to Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew chapter 4. Walking in the fullness of God. You need to go through certain things and you must be able to know who you are and overcome them. Nicodemus came and said, we know who you are, but I don't know who I am. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you can know who you are by walking into the divine purpose for your life. Matthew chapter 4. And when the tempter, verse 3, when the tempter came to him, he said, if, if thou be the son of God, if thou be the son of God, <laughs> if it's a doubting cross, if here is identity problem. It's identity. Do you know your identity? One of the areas that Satan will fight you is for you to know your identity. And the second area is your purpose. If Satan can take you out of your identity and frustrate you with your purpose, you are gone. This is where this temptation is coming from. Satan came to Jesus. He saw that Jesus was hungry for something. Adam and Eve were hungry for something. They were hanging around a tree. They were desiring to eat that fruit. Satan saw that Jesus was hungry. So the point where Adam and Eve were tempted to eat a forbidden fruit, Jesus has come to that point. Jesus had been starved. Jesus had gone through fasting. Therefore, he had been starved for physical fruit. Adam and Eve has been deprived from the tree. They have been starved from getting access to that fruits. 
And Satan brought them there. You see the parallel lines in these areas. Or do you see the similarities in our temptation? It's not physical, but it is spiritual. It might take place in the physical, but the purpose is to cause us to deflect from who we are, walking in the fullness of God. Satan asked Jesus, are you truly the son of God? Are you sure? I don't believe in I know you in heaven. I paraphrase it here. I know you in heaven. You drove me out. I hated you. Because God wanted to make man in, in your image. I, I didn't like anything of you. You allowed me to build a garden of Aden and you took it from me. You allowed me to enjoy the garden of Aden, everything in there, and you took it away from me. You wanted to give it to man. That's why I hated you. Are you not the son of God who fought me and drove me out of that garden, out of the heavens? You have come. I know you have come. I know you have come. But I don't believe that it is you. It is very miserable that your father have reduced you to the human being. Do you know who they are? They are the most weakest thing that God has ever made. There are people who are very foolish. I can get them. Just, I can get them easily. So I want to test you first of all. I know if you know that you are the son of God first. Let's prove it. Prove to me if you are the son of God. If you qualify to stand before me. Who do you think you are, Jesus? I am. The word belongs to me now. So Satan did not talk to Jesus the way he spoke to Adam and Eve. No. He addressed Jesus by putting doubt in God again. He put doubt in Adam and Eve towards God. God knows that the day you eat this forbidden fruit, you become like him. Put doubt. Now he came to Jesus, he put the same doubt. Are you sure you're the son of God? Do you believe? Do you believe that God is with you? I'm not sure. Mm, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But if you are, if you are, then turn this stone into bread. Another soulish rim again, food. Another something Another something. Is that not why you are following God? Is that not the reason why you want to serve God? Your belly. Why you will eat. If you are truly the son of God, turn this stone and make it bread. Beloved, Jesus was hungry. Jesus was laid in a manger. In the manger means come from the French word manje, manger, manje. When Jesus was born, he was laid in a manger. I mean, Jesus is a food that animals should feed on him. What animals? Sheep. <laughs> you know the Bible consider Christians to be sheep? The only animals that God take human character and the characteristics with the sheep. So Jesus was born into a couple of sheep. He slept with them. And in those days, the manger was made out of metal or stone. So let's assume that Jesus was put in a stone one. In a stone one. So to contain food. Satan said, you are a food that people need to feed on you. But I doubt your integrity and I doubt your personality. So if you are truly who you are, turn this stone into bread. Be very careful if you want to walk into the fullness of God. What you turn into consumption. When your passion and your desire becomes what you want to eat, what you want to eat, what you want to eat, what about me, what about me, what about me, be very, very careful because you may be walking far away from your purpose. Number one, Satan put doubt in the identity of Jesus Christ if you are the son of God. If Satan can walk you out of your inheritance and out of your identity, 
He will let you know that you are not who you are. You were born in sin, therefore you can't make it. No matter what you do, you are a sinner. That's not true. That's not true. Jesus answered and said, according to Deuteronomy, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that come out of the mouth, proceed out of the mouth of God. Jesus defined the existence of man. Jesus defined the nutrition of man, not only on physical food, but also the spiritual food, the word that comes from the mouth of God. So he said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That was how to walk in the spirit, not turning the spiritual thing to physical things and eat. Jesus felt at the first time of all the 40 days fasting, Jesus smelled bread all around him. He smelled it. The temptation wasn't all that easy. If you don't have a desire in you, temptation is not temptation. If you don't have hunger in you, the temptation is not strong. If you are able to walk away from cigarettes because you are not a smoker, stop accusing and insulting those who smoke. Because if you are addicted, it takes the grace of God. If you have been able to walk away from pornography, if you have been able to walk away from masturbation, pray for those who are stuck in it. And let them know that so long as they are doing that, they are going to hell. There is no middle way. Let them know the reality of it. Tell people about the reality of sin. And let them know that if you have been able to walk away from, they also have everything that it takes to walk away from. He surrounded your will to God. Jesus surrounded his will to the word of God. He said, man should not live. My life should not exist here on earth by surrendering to food, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Devil didn't stop there because he has not won yet. So the Bible said that he took him the devil took him up into a whole city and seated him in the pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, Ye shall give his angels charge concerning you, and their hands, and they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt. Strike thy feet against stone. <laughs> Do you know what? Jesus has overcome Satan by the word of God. Therefore, Satan said, Okay, 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 I got you. I can't win you in my area. Now I'm operating in flesh. So the only, the only area that I can get to you is to get you into the word of God. To get you into the word of God, I must be able to get you to contradict and find yourself in a position to sin against God. Showed him and said, it is written, and he quoted Psalm 91, it is written that when you fall down, angels will watch you. That scripture was written about you. It was for you. It was for you because you're a human being. And it was made for human beings. That he assigned his angels to take charge of his people on earth. So, um, why don't you try it? <laughs> so, prove yourself that you're the son of God. I just want you to know that you're the son of God. Mm, another doubt. Another doubt. So Satan put the word of God into question. Put the word of God into question in your life. How many times do you question the word of God? If this is God, why has this thing happened? What if it is not of God? What if it is of God? Stop asking if it is of God. And ask God, God, I don't understand. I don't know why. I know it is you. Because nothing can happen to my life without you permitting it or without me permitting it. When I give permission, you allow it to happen. My life belongs to you. So why is Satan... Playing up with my life like that. 
So when it happens like that, what you need to do is to come to God and surrender your ways to God. And therefore Jesus answered in verse number verse number 7, Jesus said, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Don't put your God into tempts. Don't tempt God. Don't tempt God. In this battle of walking in the fullness of God, is the battle of the word of God trying to rule our spirit and walking in the fullness of the spirit of God. Satan will always try to pull us out of walking in the fullness of God and walking in carnality and in flesh. If you and me are able, and if you and me will be able to walk in the dimension that God wants us to operate, your life and my life must totally be dedicated to the word of God. The word of God. The word of God is our source. God said, let us make, unless we are linked with our souls. The word of God is our source. God is our soul. He's a spirit. We walk in the spirit. And we can maintain our spiritual walk by linking to the word of God 24-7. In his presence, only shall we dwell. Be under the influence of the will of God. Allow God to direct your path. Give him the upper hand over your life. And you will be marveled how your life will become. The Bible says in verse 8, again, the devil taking him up into the exceeding high mountains and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Now Satan has come to know that he has to tempt Jesus so, uh, 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 physically, spiritually, and all aspects in every area. So now he takes Jesus into another level and said, this is the final level. If I lose, I lose. He said, Jesus, I know that you have come to ask for forgiveness of man, that the Holy Spirit can come and dwell in man again, can, can sit here on earth, and that man can live for spiritual realm. I know that is why you have come. No worries. The man has rendered that opportunity and that authority to me. I can give it to you without you going through all that you want to do. I know I don't know what your plans are, but I know that you have come to take that thing. So uh, no worries. All that you need to do is to bow before me, and I will give you the keys straight away without you worrying. Jesus is principal God. Jesus could have beaten Satan, taking the key out of his hands, threw him into the dungeon of a uh, uh, of, uh, lake of fire. But he said, no, there are some people that I need to. I need to allow them to make these choices that Satan I gave him to. So the human being, the human race have not stopped yet. My father had not uh, thought of destroying human race yet. He want to give human race a little uh, a measure of time for man to live here on earth. And after all the soul that he has in heaven, no one wants to come to earth again. Then the Father will stop the process of creating human being. So I can't take this thing away from Satan. I need to allow Satan to live here on earth and still continue to do this job by taking a man into temptation that he has taken me through. That all human beings who want to live for me, they will overcome Satan the way I overcame Satan by responding to the Holy Spirit, by yielding to the Spirit, yielding to the Father's desire, yielding to the Father's wishes, walking in the ways of the Father, not the ways of man. So Jesus told Satan, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt not worship the Lord thy God, and in him alone shalt thou worship. Satan is about your worship. To walk in the fullness of God, you need to be a worshiper. You need to daily walk in worshiping God, not worshiping your belly, not worshiping your body, not worshiping your feelings and your emotions. Are you a worshiper? Are you working in the fullness of God? Whom do you worship? You dress every day to suit yourself. How many times do you stand in the mirror? How many times do you worship yourself? You worship image, images that you have made for yourself. 
God is not God over your life. I want to bring this teaching to an end. I'm giving you the opportunity as we have started this series. There are so many things I'm going to share with you. But that is what I may permit you to give you to you today. And I don't want to break this broadcast without giving opportunity to become a worshiper. A person that walk in the spirit. Totally walking in the spirit. That every day of your life, you live your life to please God. You don't live your life to please yourself. That your life might come in alignment with the will of God. That you will live as a spirit. Jesus as a spirit yielded to the spiritual hunger. What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for the spiritual things? Or you are hungry for the carnal things? Jesus want to make all things new for you. He had made it, but maybe you have not accepted him now. So I don't want to go out without giving you this opportunity to walk in the fullness of God. Before that, let me read you some few scriptures. First, uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. To run out. Colossians chapter 1. Man is a spirit. And man needs to walk in the spirit, which is the fullness of God. Colossians chapter 1, the verse number 15. Colossians 1 15. The Bible says this Who is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So if we want to walk in the fullness of God, we need to walk in the image of Jesus Christ. We need to imitate Christ. We need to do what he did. We need to behave the way he behaved. Our ways must be aligned. Our ways must form part of the ways of Christ. To walk in obedience of what Jesus did. Surrender our will and our ways to God as Jesus did. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 17. Now unto the king, the eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor, glory forever and ever. Who is the king? Jesus Christ. He's immortal. He is invisible. He dwells in man if man invites him into his life. Do you want to live with this immortality? Do you want to live here on earth yet operate as immortal being? Apostle Paul said in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the immortality would take over the mortality. Very soon our life will change. Christians, we will receive the immortal life. The spirit which is in us will take over this carnal body. And that is what I want you to do, to begin to live for the spirit. To begin to generate that spirit. To activate it to live for eternal purpose and eternal reason. Finally, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. Hebrews, Hebrews 11, 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he and the all are seeing him who is invisible. By faith, by faith, Moses left Egypt. Moses left the people of, he led the children of Israel from Egypt for them to pursue the invisible God. Beloved, do you know this God? Have you surrendered your will and your ways to God? Are you a Christian? And are you working in the fullness of God? I want to give you the opportunity to work in the fullness of God by following these teachings that I've given to you. First of all, Changing every aspect of your life by inviting Jesus into your life. Welcome him as the Lord of your Savior and he will do the rest for you. By faith, you walk like him. Shortly pray this prayer that I always lead people as a formula and also as the steps that will encourage them to walk towards God. Pray this prayer, Lord Jesus. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sin. I believe I am a sinner. 
have driven your presence out of my life, in my ways. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive all the sins I've committed against you. This time you can name the sins that you have done. You know them. Mention them bit by bit. Every sin. Ask God to forgive you. Ask God to forgive you of people that you have offended also. Now, Lord, I invite you into my life. Welcome your Holy Spirit to take possession of my heart. Give me your heart. Give me your mind. Possess me, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Help me to live the rest of my life for your glory. I love you because you love me. Beloved, if you have prayed that prayer, it's the steps to Christ. Jesus has come, but you need to continue. It's a journey. It's the first step. I want you to continue to confess all your sins. Go to people that you have offended. Pay every price that you need to pay. Those people that you owe, pay them. Because salvation and this a lot. We call it restitution. Do it. And now welcome the Holy Spirit. Give him the freedom to live in your heart by finding a Bible-based church, a church that teaches the word of God and the word of God for truth. Find one. If you don't have one, let this ministry be your church. You can listen to me 24-7. On this radio, God's word, uh, endtimeradio.com. You can listen to me every day. You can also watch me on YouTube. You can also watch us on www.godswordforus.com. If you are listening to this teaching and you want me to pray with you, I'll be very happy to pray with you. You can join me on Facebook. My name is Gabriel, Pastor Adadi on Facebook. I'll be your mentor. I'll be your guide. I'll pray with you. It doesn't matter how far Satan has taken you. If you have any issues, let's agree together and let the glory of God affect our life. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. I praise you. I honor you for the life of people who are listening to this broadcast. I stretch from my hands and to release their soul from every power of the enemy against them. I break every resistance in your life. I command every power of darkness to go out of your life. In the name of Jesus Christ, him that the sun set free shall be free. I command the enemy to take his dirty hands out of your life. I set your mind free. I minister the healing of God over your life. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Be free in the name of Jesus Christ. If you are going through any sickness, any disease, say healing belongs to me. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, I receive my healings in Jesus' name. Healing belongs to me because of what Jesus has done. I receive my healing. Anything that you are going through that you need your breakthrough, claim that it belongs to you because Jesus did it on the cross for you. And when we have prayed that thing, believe it and begin to thank God. Father, we thank you. Father, I honor you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Beloved, that is what Sam may permit us to give it to you today. And God's willing. We shall come back again and give you more as God give us the chance. To him be the glory now and forever in Jesus' name. I want to take you back to our program that you continue to listen to the radio, that your life will be changed forever in Jesus' name. Amen. 